Hi guys, in this lesson we're going to take a look at the Carnot cycle. This is one of several different thermodynamic cycles that we would cover in chemical engineering. So the Carnot cycle is the most simple and easiest to understand of the thermodynamic cycles. And it essentially consists of two isothermal steps and two adiabatic steps. Now the four steps can be considered as totally reversible. Now, in the isothermal steps, at a higher temperature of TH and a heat of QH, this is the amount that is absorbed by the working fluid of the engine. In the isothermal step at the lower temperature, we have TC, and the heat QC is the heat rejected by the fluid. Now, the typical schematics would look something like this. This is for a steady flow Carnot engine. So what we, can, what we can do here is express these on PV and TS diagrams, and we'll look at them in some more detail later on. But essentially what we have is if we compare the, the streams here, so we have point 0.1. So point 0.1 is at this point here. So if we go from point 0.1 to point 0.2, we have Q coming in to the system. So that is in the isothermal turbine. So what we have is constant temperature, but we increase the entropy of the system. We have an entropy temperature diagram here. So then what we then do from point 0.2 to point 0.3 is we go through the isentropic turbine, which gives out our network. An isentropic process means it constant entropy. But this is where we decrease the temperature. And then from 3 to 4, we decrease our entropy at constant temperature, this is where we give out our heat, and then the cycle regenerates itself again. Now again, as we say, this is the, the simplest of the steady state flow processes in which we would have steam that is generated within a boiler and is then expanded in an adiabatic turbine, and this would produce our work. Now the steam leaving the turbine would pass through the condenser where some of the, the vapour would be condensed which would then be pumped adiabatically back to the boiler. And as the power produced by the turbine is sufficiently higher than that required by the pump, then the net power output is approximately equal to the difference between the rate of the heat input in the boiler and the rate of heat rejection in the condenser. So what we can do is we can measure the amount of heat that comes into the system, the amount of heat that leaves or is rejected by the system, and the difference between those values is related and is approximately that of the amount of work that has been generated by the system. Now the work produced can be expressed as the following equation. So we have the magnitude of QH and QC. Now the magnitude here just means that one of these values are going to be, if it's negative, we just take the positive value because it is just the difference between these values. We don't account for the negatives. Now the thermal efficiency is then given by the ratio of the work output divided by the amount of heat that is coming into the system. Now we can also express this in terms of the temperature. So we can have 1 minus Tc over Th. Now for this formula, the efficiency will increase as Th increases or Tc decreases. So again we can play about, instead of with the work in the Qn, we can play about with the actual operating temperatures of the system and that will have an adverse effect on the thermal efficiency of the process. Now the paths on the TS diagram which we've seen a couple of slides ago represents the property changes of the fluid as it flows through the individual pieces of the equipment within the cycle. So again we see this characteristic rectangular shape. This is our Carnot cycle. And this here is the saturation curve for a given uh, set of chemicals. So 
This could be for steam, this could be for a refrigeration cycle, it just depends. But this is a very generic uh, chart that you would expect to see for thermodynamic uh, cycles. Now, so this is the TS diagram, we can also have a PV diagram as well. So we just plot the temperature against the entropy of the system. Now the sequence of the paths that are represented by the Carnot cycle were at 1, 2, 3 and 4. So let's go through these one at a time. Now this is the idealization of a thermodynamic cycle. The actual cycles are represented by things like the ideal Rankine cycle, the organic Rankine cycle, the diesel uh, engines, and there is several other different variations that we do talk about in our thermodynamics uh, course. So be sure to head over to our website and check that out for more information. Now, from stages 1 to 2, we have the isothermal addition of heat at the temperature TH. So this is represented by the horizontal line here. So we have a constant temperature. We are increasing the entropy because isothermal means constant temperature. So the actual temperature of the system isn't increasing. What we are increasing is the entropy. And it's also assumed that the vaporization process occurs at constant pressure and produces the saturated steam of the vapor, namely steam, for saturated liquid water. So essentially what we have here is this saturation line what we have at this from this point here anything in this region is liquid this is the mixture of saturated liquid and vapor so this is a mixture of liquid and vapor within the system if we are above and to the right of this curve we have saturated vapor so we have no liquid present in the mixture if we are in this part of the chart. Likewise, in this part of the chart, we would have no vapour, we would have 100% liquid. Now, stages 2 to 3 is the reversible adiabatic expansion of the saturation vapour to a pressure at which T saturated is equal to Tc. So that is the, um, the temperature for heat rejection. So we usually go around and deal with the saturation temperatures and pressures. So here we are on the saturated vapour line. So that means that here we have no liquid at this point. So when we do the adiabatic expansion, we drop our temperature from TH to TC. So that's the inlet temperature. This is the outlet temperature in the condenser. Then what we do here is we keep the entropy the same. But by keeping it the same and decreasing the temperature, we then enter inside the curve, which means that we have a mixture of saturated vapour and saturated liquid. Now the isentropic expansion process is repeated by the vertical line as we said here. So this is known as isentropic for constant entropy. Now from 3 to 4 is the isothermal rejection of heat. So this is the opposite from 1 to 2. So we're constant temperature, isothermal, but we now have the rejection of the heat from this entropy value to that entropy value at the same constant Tc or the saturated temperature. Now from 4 to 1, what we then do is this takes us back to complete the cycle. So we then go to the original state, whereby we convert the mixture of vapour and liquid existing in the condenser into saturated liquid at point 1. So here we still have a mixture of vapour and liquid. By increasing the temperature, we get to the saturation point for TH. So that means that we no longer have vapour, we have saturated liquid. And this is the isentropic compression process for this uh, section of the chart, because again, we have constant entropy. Now again, the thermal efficiency of the cycle is that of the Carnot engine can be given by, as we've seen before. Now since this is reversible, it can be used as a standard of comparison for the actual steam power plants. And the bigger the difference between the two temperatures, the higher the efficiency of the cycle. Because remember, the ultimate driving force for heat transfer is a difference in the temperature. So a greater temperature gradient 
we will have a better and higher efficiency of the process. Now let's take a look at a working exercise here. So we have a Carnot cycle that operates at 30 bar and 0 0.04 bar. So this is the TS diagram whereby we have our pressures and we can determine our corresponding temperatures for these given pressures. And we need to determine the heat transferred, the work, the cycle efficiency, the specific steam consumption and the work ratio. Now these are a typical question that you would expect for a thermodynamic uh, module. So let's look at part A. So what we have here is we need to determine the enthalpy at these given pressures. So the enthalpy at 30 bar, this is going to be HF, is going to be 1008 kilojoules per kilogram. Then, so HF is the enthalpy of the liquid at 30 bar. Now we get these values from the steam table. Now we have, if you don't have a copy of the steam table, if you are already registered on our website, you can get free access to a resource library with over 20 different reference texts. We have a copy of the steam table in there, so be sure to, to check that one out. So these values are all coming from the steam table. So HF is the enthalpy of the liquid at 30 bar. HG is the enthalpy of the vapor at 30 bar. So that's H2, H3, that's for 2 and 3 here. So then what we do is we say that from step 3 to 4 is constant entropy, i.e. isentropic, so S4 must be equal to S3. So we can determine the entropy at uh, point 3 will be the entropy at point 4. So S3 is the entropy of the, the vapour at 30 bar, so we can read that as 6.186 kilojoules per kilogram kelvin. So then what we can then do is express this equation in terms of the entropy and the mass fraction of the, the system at this point. Because remember, we're going to have a mixture of liquid and vapour. We need to determine the quantity of each for this given set of conditions. So what we say is that S4 is equal to X4SG. Now this SG is at 0 0.04 bar, because that's at this point here. Then it's going to be plus 1 minus X4 multiplied by SF at 0 0.04 bar. So that's going to be the entropy of the liquid at that uh, pressure. And this is the entropy of the gas at this pressure. Now we know that S4 equals S3, and we have S3 here which means that when we substitute in the values, we can perform simultaneous equations and we can determine the values of uh, X4 because we can get the value of SG and we can get the value of SF from the steam table because these are at the corresponding pressures. We can then rearrange and get the ratio, so the value of X4, we can get S4 minus SF divided by SG minus SF. We have all these values, so we get an X4 value of 0.716. So now that we know that, we can then work out the corresponding enthalpy at that point, based on the same equation, except for instead of the entropy, we have the enthalpy values. So we can determine the enthalpy at point 4. So we have our X4, we have our enthalpy at the 0 0.04 bar for the vapour, we have the enthalpy at 0 0.04 bar for the liquid, that will give us an overall mixture enthalpy of 1863 kilojoules per kilogram, and that's at this point here. Now we know that for S1, so this is the entropy at this point, we use the same equation because we're still at 0 0.04 bar. We now need to know the composition at X1. So we rearrange and we get the value of 0 0.276. Now this is the fraction of the vapour. So you can see that the vapour, we're closer to the saturated vapour line at 0.4 than we are at 0.1. So that means that we'd have 27.6% vapour in that mixture at this point. Whereas here we had 71.6% vapour. So that is the, the fraction that we're finding. That's what X1 and X4 have been. 
So then what we can do is substitute in these values just like this equation and we can determine the enthalpy at point 1 to be 792.5 kilojoules per kilogram. So then we can therefore determine the Qn value because remember Qn is the difference between H3 and H2. So we now have all the enthalpies that we need. So we can determine that Qn is 1,795 kilojoules per kilogram. We can determine that Q out happens at this point here because remember Q into the system heats up. We increase from saturated liquid to saturated vapor. And then we decrease our entropy because we have Q out coming here. So that's going to be H1 minus H4. Now remember that Q out should be in negative quantity because that is heat being released to the system. So we have minus 1071.5. And then part B, what we can then start to do is say that from 3 to 4 is our turbine work. Because remember we give out our turbine work here. And then from 1 to 2, we have our compressor work, which is adding work back into the system. So our turbine work is going to be H4 minus H3. So that's going to give us 940 kilojoules per kilogram of energy out of the system. That's why it's negative. And our compressor work is going to be H2 minus H1. And that's going to give us 215.5 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's the amount of energy required to go from point 1 to point 2. So now that we know all these values, we can then start to determine how efficient this cycle actually is. So the cycle efficiency from the previous few uh, slides was that the net work divided by the amount of energy that came in. So what we do is we say we have minus 940 plus 215.5. So that's the turbine and the compressor. Now remember, this will be a negative quantity, but that is okay because we take the positive value because of these magnitude signs. And then we divide by our Qn, so we get a cycle efficiency of 0 0.404. So we've just got just above 40% cycle efficiency. The specific steam consumption is going to be the 3600 divided by the net work. So that will give us a net work of 4.968 kilograms per kilowatt kelvin of energy. So that is the amount of steam that we would, we would consume to achieve this thermodynamic cycle. And then lastly, the work ratio is going to be the net work divided by the turbine work, because the work ratio will essentially tell us how much energy are we going to achieve from this system, because... Ultimately, for this to work, we need to ensure that we have a higher output for the turbine than we do for the input of the compressor. So that means that we have a work ratio of 0.77, or a 77% work uh, percentage ratio. And that's how you would go about analysing these types of systems. So that's the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful in helping you understand the thermodynamic cycle of the Carnot cycle. The methodology and the thinking behind this uh, type of thermodynamic system is very similar to the more realistic uh, systems such as the, the ORC, but there are some added extras that we would have to take into consideration, but the general principle is there. So if you like this video, please give it a like and leave any comments in the comments section below. For more content, please subscribe to the channel and we we'll hope to see you in another video.